Hi, everybody. Um, thanks so much for coming. It's good to see all of you. Um, my name is Stephen Fraley. I'm the co-chair of the graduate uh, program in fashion photography here at uh, good old SVA. Um, Eric is our uh, second annual visiting artist uh, to the program. Um, and I just want to thank him uh, for his involvement. We're very grateful for uh, him being involved in what, uh, what we're doing and, and for him to be here tonight. Um, I also just want to give a special shout out to our friends who are visiting from the London College of Fashion who have just arrived and will be with us for the rest of the week. So it's good to have you guys here and we're looking forward to all kinds of uh, great things happening. So um, my role uh, standing up here is to introduce the people who you probably know very well what their accomplishments are. And, uh, but nonetheless, uh, please allow me to mention that uh, Vince Letty, uh, the distinguished photography critic, was the recipient of the In Infinity Award in 2005 by the International Center of Photography for his critical writing. He has curated exhibitions at White Cube in London and White Columns here in New York and has contributed to catalogs regarding the work of Peter Hujar, Saul Leiter, Eddie Sliman, Richard Avedon, and dozens and dozens of other publications. He has been the photography critic of The New Yorker since 2005, and before that, uh, he was at The Village Voice for 20 years. His writing on photography appears regularly in Photograph Magazine and Art Forum, Vince is a faculty person in this graduate program in fashion photography here at SVA, and we are, we are honored by his participation in our program. Uh, Eric Madigan Heck is a regular contributor, contributor to Harper's Bazaar UK, New York Magazine, the New York Times Magazine, and the New Yorker, and he's represented by IMG William Morris Endeavor. He has shot campaigns for Neiman Marcus, Etro, Tom Brown, and Kinzo. Eric has also been honored by the ICP with an Infinity Award in 2015, and a monograph of his work will be published very soon by uh, Tims and Hudson and Abrams in, um, did you say April? Uh, March. March. So without any further delay, please welcome Vince Letty and Eric Madigan Heck. Thank you. I realized the last time I was seated on the stage having a one-on-one -on -one conversation, it was with Saul Leiter, wow. um, who proved to be difficult, uh, <laughs> who was charming but un ornery in some ways, and, um, and almost resisted questioning. So I'm hoping that you'll be a little more uh, okay. easygoing. Uh, <laughs> and so I'd, I'd like to start with well, first I should say that I, uh, I started buying British Harper's Bazaar, which I basically paid no attention to for years, because you started working there. Uh, and I think you really transformed the magazine. Thank you very They've much. They've given you huge amounts of space. Um, and this, he's in this latest issue, 42 pages. Uh, and you said that previously they'd given you more than 60. Yeah. Um, so it's impressive. Thank you very much. And, and you really hold the page. Thank you. So, but let me go back to some history. Yeah. Some with things that I don't know. Um, where are you from, and how did you get interested in photography? So I'm from Minneapolis. Um, I started photographing when I was 14. My mother gave me a camera. As um, I used to be really into music and DJing, and I would spend hours in my bedroom kind of huddled over my turntables, just uh -huh. like not talking to people, you know, just listening to music. And I think she wanted to bring me like back out into the world. <laughs> Smart was, way to do it. Yeah, I was becoming a total like music hermit. Uh -huh. um, so she used, to, she used to give me a roll of film once a week and we'd go out on Sundays and shoot just a roll. And she, she would say, you know, you can shoot anything you want. As long as you shoot 36 exposures, oh. we'll be done. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, what an interesting exercise. Did you walk around or take a car? Or? We would drive in her car and just, she would have me point at things that interested me. She'd stop the car, we'd get out, I'd take a picture. Mm -hmm. And then maybe I'd walk a little bit, take another picture. And it would last maybe two hours. I would shoot a roll of film. Um, 
in the beginning, it was kind of a nuisance. It was like uh. I could be DJing to myself. Uh. <laughs> um, but then it be, it just became like a routine, you know. It was, it was like Sundays we would I would look forward to doing this activity, and in the beginning it wasn't. It was very mindless, you know. It was just kind of like going and getting a cup of coffee, but with the camera. Uh -huh. Did you show the work to somebody? No. Did you I, make I mean, prints when you came back? So I so then I enrolled. You know, this is freshman year. I enrolled in photography. And um, I would go to the dark room, make the prints every week. Uh -huh. But it, you know, it was it was really innocent. It was just like a, it was a hobby uh -huh. at this stage. And then there was some point that year where it just started. It just clicked, and <clears throat> I I still kind of remember knowing it was like you know meeting a part. You know, it's like meeting your wife or something, where oh. you just you're like, oh, I just know. This something is the happened. Person. Something clicked. Yeah, and it was it a picture or was it sort of? I don't of think it was a picture. Experience. I think it was just like I looked at it differently after what I, whatever moment that was. I yeah. remember looking at the picture and being like, oh, this is what I'm going to do. I know for sure. Oh. You know. Um, and it was probably, I mean, it was probably like a mundane landscape or something like not exciting necessarily, but it was, I remember knowing, you know, without any doubt that I was going to be a photographer. So, but you didn't go on to study photography, when I understand. No, I went and studied, um, I studied politics and philosophy. Uh -huh. My parents didn't think that I could be, they didn't think that I could make a lot of money at photography, so they, my dad was concerned about, Well, you know, he's a concerned father. He was like, uh, I want you to be successful, yeah. I want you to have a, a you as, know. As a philosopher? <laughs> not, not, not as a philosopher. That's not exactly a profession either. No, 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 um, it's not. Um, I went to, a, you know, I went to a liberal arts school. It, it was, you know, it was a private Catholic school, and I went there with the intention of studying political science. And I was also studying philosophy. And, but for me, the whole time, I knew I was going to be a photographer. So oh. it was like I was appeasing my parents. Uh -huh. you know, I was like, and were you taking photography sort of on the side? I was taking it at the school as uh -huh. well. But Where I, was this? In Rhode Island. OK. Yeah. Not, but it not wasn't RISD a, or no. No, 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 it wasn't RISD. Not. It was the only school I applied to and that wasn't in New York. Uh -huh. And after September 11th, my parents were like, you're not going to go to school in New York. Uh -huh. Um, which, I mean, I was, you know, I'm a teenager, so I was still under my parents' wing. Right. And, and finances, I assume. Exactly. Um, so this was my safety school that I had applied to. I'd never been to Rhode Island in my life mm -hmm. until the first day of school. And I showed up and I was like, wow, this is amazing. <laughs> it's oh. really beautiful. Uh -huh. um, and it was, it was an amazing political science program, but it wasn't, you know, the arts program was tiny. so like a little closet. Oh, so but it was still something you could do on the side. Yeah, I was still like making darkroom prints, and you know, my whole career until two thousand seven, I only shot black and white. Oh, yeah, that's kind of shocking. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah, I only I hated color photography. Oh, I I, I any color <laughs> photography I saw, I thought was unlookable. I uh, yeah, that's so well. Maybe I should, I should ask this question then. <laughs> How did you, I mean, that's a major transition because sure. I think of you as the color photographer in many ways and so much, your, your, your work is so much about color. Yeah. Uh, how did that? Well, I think for, you know, for change? me, like, I learned, I learned photography by going to Barnes & Noble in Minneapolis and reading, you know, Henri Cartier-Bresson, August Sander, um, Harry Callahan, you know, I, I read my way through the history of photography by going to the bookstore oh. and like not buying the books, but sitting oh. in the in the aisle for two hours and just <laughs> looking at every single picture. And for me, you know, I was such a pure purist with with photography. I felt like it was it had to be black and white, mm. and you know, the subject matter was street photography and serious portraiture. And this is what you were doing as well. This is what I was doing. Uh -huh. And you know, my introduction to color photography 
was like William Eggleston, who I didn't care for at all. Uh -huh. And my favorite photographer was Harry Callahan. And I, his work, when he started doing color photography, I thought it was actually really bad. And so I kind of viewed it as like the demise of Harry Callahan was the introduction of color. Uh, <laughs> so from, have you, did you change that opinion along the way? No, I still believe that. Oh. I think it's, <laughs> I think it's, color work is really, really bad. Uh, and he's the best, you know, I, to me, he's the only photographer that's, that's made a lasting impression, mm, you know. Okay. Um, well, okay, so well then, how did you transition into color? I mean, well, so, you, it, because I, you know, like I said, I feel you're so identified with it now. Yeah. I was surprised to see that your book actually includes some black and white work. Right. But I don't really think of you that way. Yeah. <laughs> well, the thing was, I, I grew up painting. My mother's a painter. Oh. And um, I always wanted to be a painter, but I was a terrible painter. You know, I, I, I don't... I'll take your word for it. <laughs> you can take my word for it. I, I don't have the patience. And, you know, I'm not, tech, I'm not technically able to express myself with a paintbrush. But I always thought of my pictures as paintings when I was making them. I would try to create scenes in my mind that I may have already seen from a, from a painter before or trying to imagine it as a... As a I don't know, more of situations that I had seen in paintings as opposed to photographs. Mm. But I always felt like I had to make them as black and white images because to me that's what photography was. You know, it was, the, the history of photography had been shown to me as like hierarchical in black and white. Right, right. And, but uh, yet you... So at one point, okay, go ahead. I decided if I'm gonna do color, I want to. I want it to just be about the color, and I really want to start creating the paintings that I would like to make as paintings, mm -hmm. but as photographs. Oh, and so it was. A, it was a choice. It was like if I'm going to do color, it has to be so colorful that it's not photographic. Oh, you know, that in a, in a way that you're you're not treading on that that old tradition. Well, to me, color photography has to be about color. Uh -huh. Black and white photography is about composition, right? Okay. And, and graphic elements, because you've taken the color out of the equation, so uh, you can focus on all the other elements, but if you introduce color, to me, color is the primary thing. Uh -huh. So it might as well take over uh -huh. and become right, right. All, all powerful. You know. So when I started doing color photography, I really wanted to do processes that that could lend themselves to making it more saturated like Sarah Moon I uh, used to live in Paris and Sarah Moon uh, was a photographer that I really admired when I was in high school yeah. and she was experimenting with these dye transfer processes and like Paul Reversi was doing his color work that I also admired um, and so I started in the beginning I started shooting with large format Polaroids and tried doing different, like experimenting with actually physical processes uh -huh. to see, because um, at that time, digital photography still wasn't. And so what time are we talking about? Like 2004, 2005, 2006. You're out of college. Wait, <laughs> no. No? No, 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 2006, uh -huh. sorry. Bad at math. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, it's not exactly math, but go ahead. Sure. Um, the, but so are you out of college at that point? I mean, are you on yeah. your own? Yes. I'm, are you making a living? No, I'm, I'm, in, I'm in Paris. I'm studying. What are you doing in Paris? I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm studying. How did you get to Paris? I took a plane. Okay. <laughs> I took a plane. I woke up in Paris. Uh. <laughs> no idea how I got here. I didn't speak French. Uh. Um, was, was it just a romantic... I turned, tw I turned 21 in Paris. Okay. It wasn't very romantic. That's the only reason you need. I woke up with a bad hangover. Okay. <laughs> wondered why I was there. Uh, um, I was studying politics at the American University. In Paris. And I was okay. also taking classes at Parsons when they had a school there. Oh. They might still have a school there. Uh -huh. I don't know. Um, okay. Well, so that grounds you a little bit. Sure. All right. I needed that. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, 
<laughs> so you're not entirely fancy free, but you're in Paris. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm in Paris as a student trying to, you know, soak in what Paris has to offer. Oh. It seemed a lot more approachable to be making fashion pictures in Paris. Um, so, I, well, that's... That's, in that's, in I'm terms curious of like, about that transition then. Sure. Um, to making what I assume is personal work. Yeah. Um, that probably you weren't doing anything with. Uh, to making commercial or thinking about fashion. What, right. what made you want to or think that you could do that? Well, so I've always, <laughs> I always look at things and I'm like, I could do that better. Okay. Or I could do it differently in a way that, you know, I, I've, at the time, so I, I left Paris, came back to New York, and I actually started graduate school at Parsons. Oh. I went straight into doing my MFA, uh -huh. which in many ways I should have waited, but that was fine. Um, I started graduate school and I started an online magazine, which... Believe it or not, uh -huh. there weren't any online magazines in 2007. You know, it, it's really hard to imagine because time is such a weird thing. But in 2007, there was like, there was a thing called Fly DVD, which was uh, um, fashion films. There was Show Studio, Nick Knight. Mm -hmm. um, there still wasn't Style.com, right? Oh, oh. You still had to go to First View. Uh -huh. to look at fashion shows. Uh, and the magazine publications hadn't transitioned online yet, so there wasn't Days Digital, there wasn't any of this. So at the time, the idea of putting an online magazine was actually kind of cool. Radical. Radical. Uh -huh. <laughs> I'm going to call myself radical, but <laughs> in a way, sure. And it was like, my, my idea was, was really um, a way to get my own work out into the world but also to make a magazine without any budget, right? Because mm -hmm. all you need to do is buy a website and then call people. And so for my, the, the magazine I started was basically my work. I would call designers and I'd ask them if they'd want to be included in this publication. I would shoot it. So a designer like Christian Lacroix would send me 12 dresses from Paris. Uh -huh. I would shoot them. And then I would curate a selection of other art that I thought paired well with the fashion. Oh. So like paintings by Lucian Freud or Anselm Kiefer or a poem by whoever. Mm. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, my poetry knowledge is not up to par, uh -huh. but it used to be. And I would just create something that was really organic and it was just what I was looking at at the time. And a lot of my references are very old fashioned. Um, it was also before Fabian Barron took over Interview again, wow. and the whole merging of real art and fashion. That didn't start really happening until 2008, 2009. Uh -huh. So it was like my own wanting to like go to the Met Museum and merge that aesthetic with Belgian fashion oh. and with, uh, you know, electronic music and all these different things into one place. But it was essentially your work, yeah. um, other sort of influence, kind of mood board kind of material. Totally. Um, and did you involve any other photographers or? I tried to, but it was really, it was really about me. Okay. And it was, I mean, I hate to say it, because it, it was like, I wanted to get my work out there. It was also a very coy way of like making myself more important than I was, you know? Uh -huh. If you immediately include yourself next to Lucian Freud and <laughs> Handsome uh -huh. Kiefer, um, you know, well, there's, it's, there's... It's putting yourself in a context that you're, that is sort of ambitious, but sure. you're, that reflects your way of thinking and where what you're looking at. So it makes sense. And how long did you, did this go on? So I did it for five years. Really? Yeah. And we would make boxes of prints, and we'd sell them. We. Well, I say we. It was mostly me. Uh -huh. But I had friends. Okay. <laughs> my friend over there, Anna Crin, who helped me. Uh, I, have a, I had friends in different places who would kind of lend a hand. But we would print boxes of prints at Parsons, actually, like in their computer room mm -hmm. and in their dark room. And then we'd sell them 
had other criteria in London, Barney's here in New York, oh. and 10 Corso Como in Milan, Colette in Paris. So we do 10 boxes, and then each box was just, it was extremely expensive. It was uh -huh. kind of like a collector's thing. Interesting. And that, that was how I transitioned, because uh -huh. that took me from graduate school to getting known on a broader scale to where people started hiring me. Uh -huh. That was kind of the... So that's what I was going to ask. But I, did, it did, I didn't make it for that reason. I made it just because I wanted... I really wanted to. I really wanted to publish somewhere, and nobody would publish me. Uh -huh. You know, it was kind of a necessity. It was like, well, if you guys aren't going to publish me, I'll just publish myself. And but to get to the to Colette and Ten Corso Como, they had to have bought you on some level. They had to be interested in in your vision. Yeah. Well, we had great press. Or I had great press from the beginning. Uh -huh. Like the first issue we put out, the New York Times ran in print in the arts and leisure section, front page, one of my pictures, and a blurb that said, the world's most expensive magazine. Oh. Which was a great tagline in oh. terms of like getting people's attention. But it was, it, first of all, it was not true. Oh. It was extremely divisive, because a lot of people were like, well, fuck that guy. Yeah, right. You know, like, <laughs> he's obviously a jerk. I don't want anything to do with it. And then other people are like, oh, that's, you know, like, that's crazy. It's, I can't believe you would pay $7,000 for a box. And in reality. Literally? Yeah, I mean, they were like $7,500. But uh -huh. it was, you would get 20 prints. You know what I mean? By an so, unknown person. But, well, no, <laughs> it wasn't just, it wasn't just, it wasn't just me. Like, we would make prints of, other artists, okay. you know, with the gallery's permission. So it was like, you would get a print by Anselm Kiefer, and you'd get a print of mine, and you'd get a print of, you know, Jamie Isaiah, who's a photographer. Um, so it was a, a collection. It was a mix. It was a mixture of, of right. the issue, um, which I actually thought was a really good price, to be honest, because you could take them out to have 20 pieces of art in your home. Uh -huh. um, anyway, they focused on the price, because that was a great headline. A, yeah. And... But that launched us into the, you know, mm -hmm. many people's awareness. I can, yeah, yeah. I, I'm surprised that I didn't rush off and you don't know raise some is. money. <laughs> um, well, and so let's let's talk about how that actually led to editorial work, or was that the next step? Well, so I. I used to be really ambitious when I was in my 20s, and I would write letters to people I liked, and which now I think back, and I'm like, that's kind of creepy, but it, it works, you know? And I actually- I like getting letters. <laughs> they're nice. Uh. So at the time, in the very beginning, um, Anne Demi Olmeister was one of my biggest, I, I loved her fashion since I was like 15. Okay, well, let me stop you there. Sure. Because, I mean, a lot There's of... a point to it, yeah. No, a lot of photographers, <laughs> a lot of fashion photographers have yeah. zero interest in clothes and fashion. They could right. care less. Um, and I'm interested that you, that that was part of your interest as well. Totally. Well, I was really interested in fashion separately from photography. Uh -huh. You know, like, my interest in photography were purely photographic, like street scenes, portraiture, nothing to do with fashion photography. And then I was really interested in fashion and specifically like the Belgian scene. Mm -hmm. um, and the kind of avant-garde design. Yeah, yeah. like Antoine Meester, Dries, like the Antwerp 11, Comme des Garçons, what was happening in Japan. But I was interested in fashion as sculpture. Uh -huh. So when I would look at it, you know, I was, I was never interested in fashion as a cultural scene, you know. Um, I really liked designers who could introduce a new silhouette that was sculptural and made you think on a, on a level that was beyond just like, that looks cool, uh -huh. you know? And there are very few. Unfortunately, a lot of them are, have retired or are soon retiring. But for me, Antoine Milmeister was the, the best. Uh -huh. And when I was in Paris, I would go up to Antwerp, um, it's like four hours on the train. And I would go, like, hang out in her store and, like, hang out, like, put myself in places that uh -huh. 
maybe she would come. So you, you know? were a total fashion geek. On For sure. Level. For sure. But I was like a white kid from Minneapolis, uh -huh. you know, like I'd, I'd wear like an Ann shirt, but like with terrible shoes. <laughs> you know, people would be like, what are you doing? <laughs> like, I don't know. <laughs> Somebody help me. <laughs> Cause like I'm, you know, inherently I'm not like a cool skinny Berlin kid who oh. can like shave his head and just look cool, like, <laughs> and that's not, you know, this is as cool as it gets. Okay. Like <laughs> Jake Crew cardigan. Um, so anyway, I, I ended up making some prints, some really large prints, and I got Anne's personal address from a friend, uh -huh. and I like rolled them in a tube and I sent them to her, and she. Uh, wrote me a letter and was like, we have to meet. Like, I, lo I love what you sent me. Mm -hmm. And like, the sentiment was amazing. And we ended up having this, um, like, really personal relationship kind of off the bat, uh -huh. which is really strange, because she was like, she was like a untouchable um, figure in my mind. And she ended up kind of becoming like a, I wouldn't say a mentor, but somebody that I would check in with in like once a year. Uh -huh. And she would, uh, we would do projects together. Some she would ask me to do and others I would say, I want to shoot your clothes just because. Through her, her press agent is Michelle Montagna, who's like one of the most powerful people in fashion in terms of like avant-garde, um, hard to get in the door of fashion. Uh -huh. So she, when Hyder started designing, she started representing Hyder Ackerman. She hired me to shoot Hyder's first men's collection in Italy. And then through that, I mean, it was just, it was very organic. Uh -huh. Like it started, like it literally started with a letter with me being like, dear Anne, I love you. <laughs> Put it in the mail. Uh -huh. And then through those just organic conversations that, you know, it led to, shooting editorial eventually plus you know so what were your first editorial experiences like uh i mean this first... Ack ackerman was that just for the house it, it was for the house and for pity umo and um i don't know where they they, they were published in various places uh -huh. my first like proper editorial commission was actually in the new york times magazine and it was a portrait of a Boston businessman. Oh. It was great. Yeah. I was so excited. <laughs> I was like, the New York Times Magazine is, you know, still to me, the, the pinnacle of where you can publish. Oh. Um, well, in, because they have a great, a great photo editor who, who really puts you in a great context. Yeah. And she gave me an assignment where I was like, I don't, how am I going to do this? Yeah, why did, how did she... She, but they always do that to me. Uh, she gives me assignments that they throw you a left, I just, a sort I'm of like, curve. why can't they just give me? <laughs> but no, I mean, she, anyway, it was great that my first assignment was like a very buttoned up businessman because it was really hard and it made me, um, you can get lazy in fashion and it's nice to go back to non-fashion publications mm -hmm. because yeah. it, you, you have to switch your mind and, to a different mode, you're shooting for a different audience. You're shooting for the world as opposed to a fashion audience, which is very specific. Well, it interests me that you do portraiture as well. Yeah. Um, but let's we'll come back to that. Sure. Uh, because I'm I'm still curious about how you jump started the fashion photo career, uh, especially if your first assignment was a portrait for you know at the Times. Yeah. Did, did she at some point have you do fashion as well? No. So I started with portraits. And then that year, um, Neiman Marcus, I, so I self-published a book. Oh. Um, and I sent it out to a thousand people, you know? Not and me. It, not, <laughs> I didn't know you, Vince. Excuse me. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, so anyway, it wound up on the desk of Georgia Christensen, who's the creative director of Neiman Marcus. Mm -hmm. I think one of her friends might have bought a book and gave it to her. And she looked at it, and she was like, great, let's hire him. And she hired me for 
the Art of Fashion campaign, oh. which historically is a really important campaign. Yeah. Started with Richard Avedon uh -huh. and, um, you know, Annie Leibovitz. Every major photographer has shot this campaign that I know of. And, and, and uh, impressive to be sort of brought in as a, an upstart. Yeah, and it would, but it was also terrifying because, you know, it was like my first real job. And it was a huge job. Uh, and, um, you know, they buy 20 pages in Vogue. It's like the insert. Um, so anyway, that, yeah, that was kind of like my first foray. Like, I, di I didn't shoot editorial. Like, people did not want to publish my work, I'm telling you. I would literally, like, knock on, I'd, like, go to Days and Confused and be like, like, I'll do it for free. I'll, like, pay you. <laughs> like, no. <laughs> Thank you, buddy. but um, yeah, I mean, it, my career was super inverted in terms of how it came to be. You so know, it because... started with with um, ads rather than an editorial, kind of, uh -huh. yeah. Which is strange because normally you do a ton of editorial work so you can get advertising, right? But yeah, it didn't really work that way for me. Well, especially to be sort of jump into that art of fashion thing in the context of so many important people who've come before you, yeah. it's an incredible springboard. Yeah, it um, was. I got very lucky. But I had met with Georgia before she hired me. Like, she uh, flew to New York, and she wanted to see who I was. And, and you know, this, this, is not to mean, this is not meant to sound arrogant, but it, it was really because I think she could tell, like, I, I truly liked the clothing. You know, like, I want to celebrate the clothes. Uh -huh. And I think that was really a selling point, especially for advertising, because my work isn't really about, it's not about sex, and it's not about <clears throat> being sexy, and it's not about being cool. Like, so, much, so many of the pictures that I want to make are about fashion as sculpture, uh -huh. you know? And if you're trying to sell clothing, that's the best way to really do want it. To see you know, it. I mean, yeah. well, it's you know, I think one of one of I my real interest in fashion photography is the fact that it it is functional uh, at best, and it, it it serves a purpose of actually showing you the garment, yeah, uh, which a lot of people could care less about these days. But I really like that you know you do have this sense of the clothing and the picture uh, and of really sort of uh, paying attention. Thank you. So clearly that started from the very beginning or, or it started before you were photographing. Yeah, well, I, I, because fashion was such a separate interest, you know? I mean, I always admired fashion, like I said, as sculpture. Uh -huh. So when I did you know, in the beginning when I was a teenager, when I looked at fashion photography, it was like, it was like boobs, you know? It's like, well, what, what, sorry. What, what is, this? is this the 80s we're talking about or 90s? 90s. 90s. Okay. You know? And I, I was looking at GQ and I was looking at magazines that my dad was getting, oh. not necessarily, um, not necessarily Vogue Italia, uh -huh. for example. Yeah, yeah. So I wasn't seeing the fantastical imagery of Mizell or like Tim Walker, what, what have you. But my notion of fashion photography was like this really cheap industry that was kind of like, like two steps away from, you know, the sex club down the street. Oh. And I didn't well, that's, want... You're clearly, you were looking <laughs> at the wrong thing at that point. Maybe. Uh. <laughs> but I don't know. I mean, was I? I mean, there a lot of... Anyway, my point was, uh, my, my notion of fashion photography was, was really a vehicle to sell sex. Uh -huh. And I admired fashion, but, and I didn't want to denigrate it with... But how could... Wait, I, let me just pull you back a little sure. bit from that. Because were you not, like, so, somehow in the course of, you know, your interest in Callahan and, and the other photographers, seeing Penn and Abaddon and Helmut Newton and... I was, I was, um, yeah, I, de I definitely was. I wasn't so interested, you know, I didn't think Penn was that great. Um, <laughs> he 
I mean, he's obviously great. Okay. <laughs> hey, it's just my opinion. It's just my opinion. Um, I, I found, yeah, I found a lot of the like 60s, 70s, 80s fashion photography to be a little bit boring. I really like Deborah Turbeville. Oh. I thought you know, that's great. interesting because I was yeah. going to ask you about her. Yeah. And the more I look at your work, the more I thought about Turbeville. Yeah. Because it's there's something very personal there, something kind of odd and you know engaged in, in the figure and. Well, know. it's also that she you know she was one of the first photographers and female fashion photographers, but to really celebrate women in a different way, mm -hmm. you know I mean she was. She was showing you a, a side of a woman that wasn't made to be a sexy object or like a a personality. They right. were just kind of like, in many ways, regular women put into more regular landscapes like Russia in these kind of beaten down scenarios, um, which to me was it was nice. Like, so it was as much about her choice of models her way for sure like her, yeah a hundred percent you know I, I mean that that's partly I think also why I thought of her when I was looking at especially this that you're do you get to choose the models to a, a to some degree yeah to a degree I mean in most of my projects I do with like bizarre um, you know there are practical reasons why we use certain models like it might be that budget alloc allocates we have to get them all from one agency or we're shooting in London and we only have these five to choose from because the rest are out of town or whatever. Yeah. But yeah, within those con within that context, I do, for sure. Because they're not like, they, they have a, a different kind of personality. They don't, yeah. they're mo mostly not the big sex bomb models. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's hard, for me it's like, I tend to stay away from models that are very well known now. Um, it's really hard to put your stamp on somebody who is, you're constantly bombarded with by photographers who have much bigger, you know, ad space. Oh, okay. Whatever, whatever, whatever. I don't know what I was doing with my hand. This, this means nothing. Um, you know, and also, my pictures aren't sexy in, in a physical and literal way, you know, so it doesn't make sense for me to shoot, like, Cara Delvine uh -huh. or what have you. Um, I mean, for me, it's like, the, you know, I'm not so interested, but I, I'm also not so interested in people in my work, you know what I mean? Oh. Like, for me, it's more about the fashion, it's the landscape, it's uh -huh. the color. So putting a recognizable figure is almost distracting and almost takes away from the work for me. So you're, so ideally the models sort of recede into the, the scene and the clothing. And yeah. Okay. Or you don't even see their face. That would be, uh, that would be my preference. Okay. <laughs> Half my book, there's no faces. <laughs> well, you know, while we're talking, yeah. we should start showing a little bit of this, this project. Yeah. The, what you're showing right now is are the opening pages of your of this book. Why don't we show? Yep. Water. So yep, this is a nice format, by the way. Thank you. Um, it comes out. Oh yeah, we, we already said that. Anyway, this is a book I've been working on for two years, um, and we'll show you. This is the pagination here. Um, feel free to <laughs> do what? I don't know. <laughs> also, if you guys have any questions, feel free to ask. Well, we're going to do that at the end. Just kidding. Uh -huh. Right. <laughs> don't say a thing. <laughs> uh. um, so yeah, so the book, the book starts out, the book is based on color. So it starts out in blue. Mm. Oh. And then it goes to green. It's like a color wheel. Oh, kind of, oh. Yeah. You didn't even figure no, that I out. No, I didn't pick, pick that up. I know. I mean, I certainly absorb the, the sense of color. Um, and I guess while you're showing this, let us let me jump to the question about landscape. Yeah. Because a lot of the opening images are pure landscape. Yeah. Or, you know, and a lot of the, 
a lot of your work does involve people in the landscape, often like deep in the landscape. Yeah. Um, so, and where does, I mean, this is very Monet. Right. A lot of these are really quite beautiful. These are, these are actually ponds, the surface of a pond that's been multiple layers put on top of each other. Oh, oh. Yeah. In various places too, like some of these are shot in Florida, some are shot in Minnesota, some are shot in France. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So can, is there a landscape painter or a photographer that, that interests you, uh, that kind of feeds into this? I mean, I, I grew up looking at um, all the Impressionist painters. Uh, for me, I love Degas landscapes. Uh -huh. My favorite painter has always been um, Bouillard. Oh. Uh -huh. And I mean, f I spent six years trying to figure out how he made his space so flat. You know, how there's no dimension between the person in the landscape and the object in the foreground. Uh -huh. And that was, that was like my quest to like make a Bouillard painting <laughs> as a photograph. Uh -huh. And I started, you know, I started with landscapes, and then for me, I well, mean, for me, the most important thing has always been using color to like flatten space. Oh, yeah. And and certainly, there's the sense of flowers and print and this profusion of of flowers, especially. Yeah. But um, but texture and and all the kind of. Um, light and color that comes into all this. Yeah, these were, um, I mean, in, in many ways too, like I love, I, a lot of the black and white photography I was doing in the beginning was landscape, and I've always loved landscape photography. And now I feel like I have to put a person in it to like justify making it. Oh. <laughs> so I try to make them as small as possible, so they disappear. And then I can publish it because it's a fashion picture. Oh, okay. So it, you know, it, it fits into the context. Yeah. Oh. Um, yeah. I mean, I still, I still shoot a lot of landscapes on my own and kind of put them aside, and with the hopes of you know a book project being able to merge. Again, like on the left, that's. That was Harper's Bazaar. And then on the right, it was just a, yeah. Um, how much of this is um, manipulated digitally or, or, where, or however later? So I don't manipulate structural things, okay. but I do the color in post. Oh. Right? So uh, to I think about it, like I try to describe it as like a painting because you start out with, the base, which is just the picture as it was, raw. Mm -hmm. And then I do layers and layers of color. And they're built up like a canvas would be. Oh. So I don't put people you don't into move places things that, around. No. Okay. But the color is dramatically different. Uh -huh. You know? Like those reds. Yeah, I mean if you were on drugs, you could maybe see that. Okay. <laughs> but if you aren't, uh, it was pretty green. You, oh. <laughs> you know? <clears throat> um, however, there are things like this. That was really a red bush, and it was sunset, uh, so it looked pretty much like that. Okay. And the, the light on her is so gorgeous. Yeah, I mean, that, that's the other thing is I, I only shoot natural light. I don't oh. light anything. Uh huh. So. That's, no, that's pretty amazing. It's a waiting game. Oh. Gotta wait for the sunset. <laughs> we were actually driving around in our car. That's Guinevere, who's a good friend of ours. And I was like, Guinevere, we're going to Vermont. You should come with me. Let's make some pictures. And we were driving around Vermont, like like driving for the light, you know, kind oh, of chasing the watching, light. Watching. Uh -huh. And then I'd be like, get out of the car. There's a red bush. <laughs> and she just ran in front of the bush and click. Mm. That was it. Um, do 
think that was a address for John Battista Valli. The book was ten, the book is ten years of work, and it was kind of bizarre, no pun intended, to put pictures together from eight years apart oh. and start to see that uh -huh. you know you take the same picture over and over and over and over and over, and you always think that you're doing something new. But, but then you see that you <laughs> did it six years ago. It. Well, here's the, the, to go back to that one. Yeah. Um, this is one of those situations where you're barely showing the the dress. Right. But it's so the atmosphere is very heavy and and uh, seductive. Uh, but there's like only the little bit of of real information there. Well, that wasn't a commission. This was just a picture that I wanted to make. Okay, that's what I was wondering, yeah. whether there's... Although, that's not to say that if it was a commission... You get away with that. Yeah, uh -huh. that they would probably still run it. Uh -huh. But... Well, it's, it's such a beautiful image. Thank you. Um, so, uh, I wanted to go back, though, to Turbeville and mentioned uh, um, Paolo Reversi. Yeah. Uh, both of whom, now that I think about it, are quite, you know, I love their use of color. There's a, a similar sensibility. Um, is, was there anybody else that, that struck you as somebody that you could relate to in fashion? Well, I mean, you know, in, in the 90s at the time, um, you know, I had a great admiration for Peter Lindbergh, um, especially because the work I was making was all black and white film. Uh -huh. and I looked at Peter's work as very much like a segue for me into fashion, but I didn't want to make, you know, work similar to his. Uh, and you're not, in a sense, one of the things I'm, I realize you, you're never really doing narrative. Well, that, that I that I like overt remember. narrative, like a yeah. Menzel story about right, like a story. I mean, not really. You know, I'm not. I never liked narrative because I didn't buy it. Oh, oh really? <laughs> yeah. I, I buy it completely. Yeah, no, I'm sure uh, you do. Uh, A lot of people do. <laughs> I don't. I mean, if it's, if it's well done. <laughs> I mean, obviously, there's a lot of people who try to do narrative that just don't know what they're doing. But Well, like in graduate school, my Joe is here. He was a professor of mine. But it would, everything would be in series, right? You, you, you were unable to produce work that wasn't in a series. That you had to have a conceptual framework. I don't... Was that annoying? But I just don't buy that premise. You know, uh -huh. like I think a photograph should be successful on its own. And I don't think it needs to adhere uh -huh. to 10 other images that look like it. Well, I totally agree that each image in, in a sequence should be successful and be able to stand on its own. But I, I also like the idea of, of telling a story. Or find you know finding a way to link those things up. I mean, well, if you're going to tell a story, like to me, somebody like Dwayne Michaels uh -huh. is great, right? But if if I want to read a story, I'm going to read a book. <laughs> and I'm not going to look at a picture. <laughs> There's a better well, medium to do a but, story. You know, I, it's I literature. Think that, that Peter Lindbergh <laughs> is a good example of that kind of narr not necessarily narrative, but a you know a sort of through line of of something he's trying to to tell. I mean, I guess, but not really. What you have like a, you have a film girls. light in a corner, right? And you have a tarp, <laughs> and you're somewhere in the desert. <laughs> How is that a story? And maybe it's there's like, a, an alien there somewhere. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> well, yeah, it's like you know, you can you put the story together in your head in a way. Yeah, uh, but you're I right. think I think narrative is a, is a word that allows people to escape making good pictures. <laughs> That's a good quote. Uh, <laughs> quote me. <Okay. laughs> um, so, but um, without with without dealing with narrative, sure. uh, you create these. You know, I think to do a forty-two page um, sequence, yeah, um, that where the pieces don't feel um, they're all quite different. Yeah, you know, all your your settings are different. You're indoors, you're outdoors, and it's like um, sustaining that, I think, is really an interesting and difficult thing to do. 
Um, Thank you. How do you go about that, or is it just a matter of like? I think it's just adrenaline because <laughs> you have to make you know those shoots. We have to do forty some odd designers in two days on location. Oh. When it's twenty degrees uh -huh. and there's no heat, and I think a lot of it is like crisis management. <laughs> yes. And I think I do my best work when I'm given um, really difficult parameters, you know. And those bizarre shoots, they're really difficult because you're, you're having to get through so many different situations and try to find some cohesive clue, like you said, which is the narrative, mm -hmm. you know. I would describe it differently. I would say it's just how do you make 40 really good pictures in two days? Uh -huh. um, and I don't know, for me, it's normally the atmosphere is the, the glue, you know, like making it less, trying to make it less about the people and making it more about the environment. Right. So that the people just become part of the environment. And then the environment is the story, if, if you will, uh -huh. you know. Well, um, one of the, I wanted to ask you about uh, beauty. Yeah, since um, I was in the uh, conversation that you have with um, Susan Bright, right? Uh, yeah. In in um, in this book, uh, you say at one point, beauty is one of the most powerful forces that surround us, yet we are taught not to talk about it. Yeah. Um, and I'm because I think beauty does seem to be one of those subjects that that. Uh, is difficult to handle in art school, mm -hmm. uh, or you know, and that's I think where people are are taught that it's uh, something that shouldn't be right. It's like the the word you shall not speak. Uh -huh. But yeah. uh, I've never believed in either. I always think that that's you know, it is what people should aim for. Right. But it has become a difficult topic. Um, and how do you get around that? Clearly, your work is very focused on beauty. Yeah. Well, I always said the rule of thumb for me was, would my mom like it? Uh, right? Like, I think when you talk about beauty... Well, the, first we need to know a little bit more about your mom. <laughs> Is she a tough critic? Yeah, I mean, she's a tough critic, but I'm I, just using that as like a general statement. Like, would your mom like it? Okay. I don't, I don't know your mom, but... <laughs> my mom would like it, yes. But um, I guess my point in that with fashion work so much, with any industry, industries are insular, you know, and people, we all can get caught up on thinking about specific things that we're taught to think about for our industry. Let's just talk about fashion. Mm -hmm. And I think when I talk about beauty, beauty is something that affects everybody. It's something that, it's an experience that any person's had in their life. You know, I'm not talking about beauty as described as makeup. I'm not talking about beauty in different specific senses. I'm talking about beauty on a, on a larger, like, experiential way, uh -huh. right? And so, for me, you know, we we don't have conversations about beauty because it's it's one of the, it's like talk, talking about religion. It's an impossible thing to really talk about. Uh, to put um, down. But to try to try to talk about it with my work, I want the image to be for everybody. Yeah. And I think that's what I'm. I think that's part of what I'm trying to talk about with beauty, is that I would like your mom or the guy on the street or somebody in a different culture who isn't, you know, versed in what Givenchy is and what Harper's Bazaar UK is, to, to have uh, <clears throat> an experience with the image or a reaction with the image emotionally and, and have, you know, beauty to me is an experience. It's like you have an object, you have yourself. And that thing in between, that's the beauty. You know, the, the object itself isn't necessarily beautiful to everybody. People get 
people get really held up on subjectivity, but right. I, I right. don't think that's the conversation. The converse, conversation is that middle place. Of how things, how, we, how you respond. Yeah, and I, you know, there, I do believe there are objective universal, universal things that people react to. Color, uh -huh. certain um, ways figures are described. Um, you can look through the history of painting and see threads popping out. And for me, those are more important than, um, I don't know, making an image that seems to be of the now. Oh, well, I mean, it interests me that you're, in a sense, there's something very classical uh, about your work. There's something romantic about it. I mean, a lot, I really think of, there's some like pre-Raphaelite things going on here. Um, and yet at the same time, you're also really interested in this very avant-garde clothing design that's, right. um, that's very intellectual in some ways yeah. and, and, not, and appeals to a very kind of narrow audience. Sure. Uh, so, I mean, to, having those two things uh, play together is, I think, what makes the work interesting. Uh, that you're, it's not sort of just a, a sop. But they're, but they're interested in beauty as well. It's a different articulation of it. Right. But, 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 you know, like in Andy Milmeister or Hyder Ackerman or Raph Simmons, their, you know, their clothing is their way of expressing their articulation of beauty, and they're very poetic, and they're very romantic. You know, it's the, the, the aesthetics are different. But when I shoot Anne de Mielmeester in a setting with little boys that look like Mario Giacomelli priests, oh. <laughs> you know, there's a, you're taking something out of the Belgian context, and you're, you're celebrating it in, a, in my own viewpoint of beauty mm -hmm. and it's you know it kind of becomes full circle um so i think there are ways to like to because also when you, when you're shooting a collection of clothing like the designer is giving you it's like handing over to you to do it's like here's a gift and you do with this what you will right um when i look at their clothing you know i imagine it in a different way than i'm sure you know they intend it to be but that, but that's the exchange. That's the beauty. Well, that's what I'm, and you are interpreting it in a way for, for us, for the world, on some level, uh, yeah. finding a way to to put that across, uh, and make it you know make it come to life on some level. Yeah. Um, I, you know, are there any Sorry. particular uh, designers that you've been talking about in this sequence? Um, yeah. So. For example, sorry, I'm just gonna. This uh, this was a series for Tom Brown that I did for his A magazine. That's actually this is in Scotland, in the Isle of Skye. Um, this was a, an example of like taking his collection and just we took the collection from New York, we flew to Scotland, we shot it, and we put it in his um, A magazine curated by. And he just said before I left, he's like, just make it about death. Oh. I was like, great. Okay. <laughs> Easy. <laughs> um, and so we, you know, we went and we made these pictures. Let me see. I think I passed a couple. Yeah, these are, it's on the left. Oh, uh -huh. You know, this is in like the northwest part of Scotland um, on an island that is, one of the oldest places that you can go oh. and expect to see a dinosaur. <laughs> um, and we just made, yeah, we just made a bunch of pictures that to me were about like almost crossing over, you know, oh. going up into that abyss and saying goodbye. Um, these are I'll just keep flicking through. This is one of my favorite pictures. I can still say uh, I know it's on the have back a favorite. Of, on the back of your book, right? Yeah. This um, is for Valentino. And um, <coughs> we shot this at the Botanical Gardens 
in the Bronx. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, often, I mean, this is a, your use of pattern on pattern on pattern is really compelling uh, and, and comes across, you know, repeatedly in the book. But then this kind of, you know, strong color really stands out. Um, I also, I do want to go ahead to the, the Gucci campaign. Yeah, um, so I'll get to... But this, I mean, it's good to see the... There's also some, toward the end of this, the, these just um, more simple, like, silhouettes. Yeah. That, that, that seem to me to go back to your talking about sculpture. Yeah, for a while I've been doing these, um, just the back of people, which I prefer. Oh. <laughs> no face. <laughs> um. So why is that? You said that before, but because you feel that the personality is distracting? or Yeah, I just, I feel like the pictures to me aren't about people. You know, I'm not interested in people necessarily. I also don't think, I don't think photography is the right medium to talk about people, you know? There's such better okay, media. That's a whole other conversation. <laughs> no, I, mean, just, I, I will not I'm have just, that conversation. I'm just right. stating facts. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you have literature and you have film. Okay. So, you know, photography, it's a... Uh, let's, let's anyway. Let's really. August Sander, I think I, excuse me. Can I, can I just get you riled up and you can say something you regret <laughs> <Let's> tomorrow? <not. laughs> um, and this kind of, the, this graphic group is really interesting to me too. Yeah. Uh, uh, it feels like you sort of subtracted a lot of material in order to, to get this, these images. Yeah. Um, for a while, I mean, it's trying to figure out how to really eliminate the person while having them still be this central focus, uh -huh. you know. The body. The body. Um, well, it does really play up the garment, yeah. the shape, the silhouette, the everything that sort of just, you know, it makes it, a, in a sense, a pure fashion image. Yeah. I also just think, you know, we see faces everywhere, all the time. You see too Is many faces. Is that a problem? Too many faces. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Let's not get into this. Again. All right, <laughs> I'm just gonna keep. <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, my, one of my favorite areas is portraiture. Mm -hmm. So, and clearly, and you're doing that as well. So, you have to deal with faces and and that and all that comes with it. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I know that you. Yeah, but a lot of the portraiture like I do is trying to make them into a sculpture. You know. Oh. We can talk about that. Okay. <laughs> This, I thought the, the one on the last, this black and white one is really striking. Mm -hmm. Is there there's still a body in there? Yeah, so the, the top was the headpiece. It was actually a, a wig. But we took from the shirt and put it into the hair. Oh. Right, so this became... It's um, a collage in a way. Yeah, this was the one series where we actually started manipulating um, scale uh -huh. and like replacing pieces. Okay. And then, yeah, here's some black and white. So then, yeah, it goes into Gucci. Which is Let's talk a little bit about this. This is the Gucci menswear campaign that you said will not actually be running. No, it's, a, I mean. It's not a campaign. No. So, well, I... I wish it was. I do, too. Okay. Yeah. Because <laughs> I'm a little tired of their advertising. But this, I, I find this really Vince nice said group. That. I didn't say that. <laughs> um, so, I was going to do a residency in Venice this fall, which I did. Mm -hmm. And before I went there, I was trying to think of designers that I would love to shoot while I was there on local Venetians. And so I wrote to Gucci 
and they brought down the menswear collection before, like right after they showed it, they got on a train from Milan, brought it down to Venice, and um, we scrambled. So we were trying to find people on the street to like wear Gucci, and it wasn't working. I was walking around. Ven Venice is such a weird place. I don't know if you've been to Venice. I have been, it's, yeah. I thought I was going to love it, and I got there, and I was like, ugh, <laughs> I have to be here for three weeks. <laughs> and eventually, I met the um, University of Venice. I met some teachers, and they introduced me to their fashion program. And I walked in, and it was like five rooms full of kids. Every single kid looked amazing. Uh -huh. Just incredible. Like, you couldn't have cast a better crowd of people. And so the stylist that, that I was working with, a good friend of mine, her name's Kat, we walked around and she's way more outgoing than I am. Yeah. So I was kind of like, I'd be like that person. And she'd walk, you know, be like over there, they'd stand up and we'd like take their picture, write down their email. And we organized a shoot over three days where we like took these kids around Venice and they were just wearing the collection and we just shot a bunch of pictures oh. um, and it was amazing too because they're fashion kids so they they really appreciated they the really clothing like you know they were like they're like oh that's how they made that and I mean so it was it was amazing to uh, see it on people who actually appreciated it yeah appreciated it well it's also I like this because there's something not exactly snapshotty, but more spontaneous about this. Yeah, it feels relaxed. It feels like, and it's you know, it has a nice uh, feel to it. Well, they you know these are all friends, like who hang out outside of school. You know, there's an authenticity just to their relationships that you don't have when you're working with models. Uh -huh. You know, um, like these two are best friends in real life. Uh -huh. And it was more just telling them to go about their day, you know? Um, and, following and I was kind of a fly on the wall. Hanging out with them. Yeah. Uh -huh. This is actually the teacher. Her name is Detta. Oh. That's in an elevator. Um, this is, the actual image is a little bit bigger. I don't know if it's just that I'm old now, so I think young people are amazing, but there's something just, uh, <laughs> like, it's you true. walked they have, in. They do have a certain <laughs> thing going on. Yeah. Um, um, but, but also, I guess, see, I find the Gucci clothes kind of ridiculous. Um, for sure. But, um, and so somehow there's, it comes, it's not exactly down to earth here, but it, it feels more believable to me. Yeah, people actually could wear these clothes. Yeah, but I mean, at the at the same time, like they they were they were the perfect casting, and they were enjoying. You know? it, yeah, like they they look like Gucci guys, but less polished. Uh, well, you know, I guess anytime you put on those stupid glasses, <laughs> um, no one's going to look. Anyway, the, the glasses are sort of, thankfully, absent in most of these pictures. So we, um, like this, I mean, right. come on. You can, <laughs> you can make up a better Gucci right. Moment. slash Wes Anderson. Right. <laughs> uh, I mean, he really looks like that at all times. Oh. oh. <laughs> this is nice, too. I like yeah. this. This is, I think, one of my favorite pictures. Um, well, so I guess one of the, it interests me that you, you find color in the landscape. And, yeah. You know, clearly you're looking for these settings, but but the you know this the color of the boat, the the brickwork, everything really is part of. It's like I don't know. I'm thinking of Funny Face too, where there, <laughs> everything seems like it's colored deliberately right. to work with you know for the that moment in the fashion picture or Antonioni movies where everything is usually painted so that it works. But uh, I just, I really like your way of you know, finding and using uh, ready-made color. Yeah, well, it's finding what's there 
and then bringing it out more. Um, is this the woman again? Yeah. Her? Yeah. She has a dramatic look. Yes, very. I mean, it, like, they were, they were a little bit looser. Um, looser? The, the pictures were looser than, than my other fashion work. Uh -huh. But it was, it was kind of an experiment. It was also nice for me to take a break from what I've been doing and go back to kind of what I was doing when I was in graduate school, like at the beginning, Would which you, was this. Uh -huh. It was like calling up a des designer and being like, hey, I really want to shoot your stuff. And <laughs> so do you, does this encourage you to sort of incorporate this looser style into other work? Um, yeah, I mean, yes and no. Like I've been thinking a lot about recently also going back to black and white for, uh -huh. I don't know, a month or something, <laughs> maybe two months. Um, yeah, I get bored really easy, so I'm always trying to figure out ways. That's a useful thing in a fashion photographer. Getting bored? Yeah, getting, no, yeah, but constantly like yeah. egging yourself on. Yeah. Uh, finding, you know, knowing that you have to do something different next time. I know, there's not a lot of monetary value in that, but. Oh, well. Well, because <laughs> people are always like, you should, they want really to love your pattern on pattern, you do, uh, and I'm like, but uh -huh. that was two years ago. Oh. <clears throat> as soon as I shoot something, I'm, I'm, I'm bored. You're ready to move on. Yeah. So this, we, I had them do parkour. Oh. <laughs> did, they, did they know how to do it? They did. They were really good. Um, but it was, I, it was great. I, I think of these more as like film stills. Wow. But I mean, for me, it was it was nice to just watch them. They're just there was nothing fake about any of this. They're they're all good friends in real life. They're having a good time. They're just goofing off. Uh -huh. And well, I, I guess what I think is also really successful about this group is that the clothes look really terrific, uh, insane but terrific. Yeah, uh, and it's and they're like they're having a good time in them. So they don't feel false somehow. Um, so this is a different series, right? Yes, so this is another series we just did in Japan. Um, this is outside of Kyoto in the mountains. This is for Departures Magazine. It was like a travel story around Japan. And then we did, we would stop in different parts of the country and shoot fashion. So it was, it was actually landscape driven from a travel perspective, oh. and then we brought the fashion in, uh -huh. um, which I thought was interesting. It was more... Had you worked in Japan before? No, it was my first time. So what, what were you... Were you looking for these kinds of spaces, or what, did you find things that, that excited you? I mean, our trip was curated, so it was, we were going into very historic, ancient places that uh, a lot of people you wouldn't necessarily be able to photograph or some places we were led into that um, like only certain Japanese government officials were able to go into. And oh. It wasn't necessarily a representative viewpoint of Japan now. It was much more of like a historic trip and like kind a of classic kind of. Yeah, classic. totally. Uh -huh. um, it's funny. I sent out that so I, every time I do a new body of work, I send an e-blast. And there's some people on my list that I don't know how they got there. Like, I didn't add them. Oh. Maybe they added themselves, yeah. what have you. And there's a fashion designer that I won't name okay. that you probably wouldn't know. Okay. German. Uh-huh. <laughs> Known, but, like, not... You'd have to know your kind of 90s. Oh, my God. Anyway, he was on my list. I have no idea how he got on my list. Uh -huh. And I sent out the sea blast with like this picture and one other picture, and he wrote back, "You have to be careful, not to be too kitsch." Oh. And I wrote back, and I was like, "What the hell, man? Uh -huh. Like, what are you talking about?" Uh -huh. <laughs> but I mean, I said it a lot nicer. And anyway, we we went down this like really horrendous email back and forth, where just like saying like. Like, I've never met this person. I don't know him at all. I have oh. no idea why he would take the time 
to, uh, to say that little comment. But then I started re-looking at the pictures through this lens of like, are they kitsch? Uh, or like, are they touristic? Or yeah, are they touristic? And it, you know, the whole thing was like, I, you know, our trip was specifically curated by these people that I did. Like, I wasn't picking the locations. Right. You know? uh, I was kind of, anyway, you guys be the judge. Uh, kind of turned me off from the whole series. <laughs> Um, mm. Wow, nice. So how many of these are published or have been published? It was a big portfolio. I want to say like 28. Oh, something like that. 26. And were the was the uh, the clothing uh, related to Japanese designers at all, or was it? Yeah. Like, well, I mean, they have you know they have their. Um, Advertisers, they have to check. And then uh -huh. we had a lot of Japanese designers in there, Japanese stylists, okay. or Japanese team, hair and makeup. Uh -huh. um, oh, yeah. So that, I mean, that was essentially the in edit of Japan. So, okay, let's just for this image, how much did you pump up the color on the flowers? Well, they're not iridescent okay. in real life. <laughs> but they are really? blue. Yeah. I mean, they are a tone of blue. Uh -huh. But they, yeah, they definitely jump out. Yeah. I wanted to make them like jellyfish. Oh. Yeah. And then the next, this is the new Harper's spread. Uh, coming after yeah. this, you mean? I know. That's in here. Oh, it's part of this. Yeah. Okay, sorry. Yeah. And this was done in London, you said. Yeah, this is in around London, South London, at the Ham House. Kind of near Richmond. That's very Turboville. Yeah. <coughs> I think it's the clothing there, too, in the, oh. the headpiece. Oh, yeah, I see. But the, just that sort of soft focus is really nice. Yeah. Gosh. So I also wanted to ask about, looking at this sequence reminded me of Beaton, of certain, certain mid-period Cecil Beaton. Right. Does he interest you as, at all? No. <laughs> No. <laughs> I mean, to be honest, I don't know his work so well. Oh. Um, he was a photographer that I like, looked at, put aside. Because I, I think there's something, and Beaton and uh, Turboville sort of meet at a certain point in terms of uh, fantasy, settings, uh, sometimes over the top, uh, but but really romance uh, yeah. as something that uh, some of your work definitely reminds me of his in that way, that, uh, that he had a very lush way of, of looking at the world at different points. I'll have to look at it again. I, I think you, <laughs> it, would, it would interest you for that reason. Also, I guess also I was thinking about um, how artful your work is, uh, and that often I miss fashion illustration. Yeah. Uh, and that your I work has a kind of um, a quality of that, of painting or drawing and. Yeah. Yeah, I I love fashion illustration, and. 
on a hierarchy of mediums, you know, I put photography kind of at the bottom. <laughs> and <laughs> illustration... Uh, did everyone hear that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Illustration has always been, you know, like I've, I've tried to make my images look like illustrations. No. Oh. In many cases, because again, like I wish I could be an illustrator instead of a photographer, but oh. I can't. So I use. Yeah, there were things sort of at the end of the sequence of your book that reminded me that had a very illustration quality. Yeah. Um, that I quite like, and and it's one of those things I, I miss in fashion magazines. I wish there would be a place for illustration again. For sure. Well, the New Yorker. Yeah. You guys keep trying to introduce photographs. Uh -huh. I don't know why you're doing that. Yeah, well, <laughs> too late to go keep back. Keep it now. illustration. <laughs> but um, you know, uh, there was a time when fashion magazines were had almost no photography, mm -hmm. and that was and there were some great illustrators. And, and and I guess that's also why I think of Beaton, yeah. because he also he was a great uh, drawer, illustrator, for a good part of his life too. Yeah. And there's, I think, a, a lot of crossover. I'll check them out. Okay. <laughs> Promise. <laughs> so I'm wondering whether we should open it up to the audience at yeah. this point, or um, if there's, if there are any questions. Uh, yeah. I'm gonna... Talk as loud as you can. Yeah. I, I mean, I always thought of it as like, I mean, you can get to anybody if you want, you know? It's, it, it is easy. I think if you think about it, is it being easy? Well, if yeah, so a practical your, example. Your like, first example of, of uh, and, and <clears throat> how do you, how do you, so, okay. If you just wrote let's say, to someone. Let's say you want to, let's say you want to, do you work with Valentino, right? Where are they based? They're based in Rome. Um, you can go through the press office, which they'll for sure say no. Um, you could go through stylists who have relationships with the press office. You could go to Rome. You could go literally to their office and watch people come out. And maybe they have drinks after work. You could go to the cafe and you could start a conversation. Oh, you work at Valentino. That's interesting. <laughs> I mean, there's a million ways. Like, you know, it's the more creative, the better. But I think the problem is that most people probably don't think it's possible. And if you start with that premise, then it's not possible, you know. But honestly, the more annoying you are, like, it kind of better for you in the long term, in the beginning, and then stop being annoying. <laughs> as quickly as possible. Yeah, but your, you know, your first example of writing to and Demil um <laughs> is really, you know, ballsy on one level, but also it, you did it innocently out of real interest. Yeah, and if that's, you know, your way of approaching something, that it seems like that you know, that's a possibility. Um, and certainly now you have a name, and it makes you know. You're, you're calling Gucci and they know who you are. Yeah. Uh, but at the beginning... You... But, I mean, yes like yes and no. I think, you know, I still, I still think that I... Many people don't know me, you know? Like, I think a lot of people know my work, but they don't know me. Like, when we called Gucci, it was through the relationship of the stylist at first. Actually, it was through... I, uh -huh. Here's how. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I want to contact Gucci. One of my best friends is the head of PR for Comme des Garçons. She is good friends with that person. I was like, hey, can you introduce me? It was just a, a process of, you know. But it wasn't like Gucci. They were like, oh my god, Eric Madigan, heck. You know, I'm not Mario Testino or whoever. Uh, okay. Someday, maybe. Um, other <laughs> questions? Yeah. <laughs> oh. <laughs>
your first magazine. Can you tell us the name of it? Yeah, it was called Nominous Quarterly. Can you tell us how you came to that name? Yeah, yeah so um, in New York, you have these signs that say no menus. And so the door to my apartment had had a sign, but it was put together. And every day I would walk in, and it would really piss me off because I had no idea what it meant. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was Latin because there was no <laughs> space. <laughs> and then one day I looked at it, and I was like, oh, that's just no menus. Right. That's so dumb. I've wasted six months of my life <laughs> trying to figure out, what, this right. out what this word is. And it was, I was looking for a name to name my, my publication. And I was like, that's perfect because, you know, it was that little space that was not there that confounded me and, you know, made me think. And sometimes the most obvious thing is like right in front it's of you. It's how, how I discovered you. Oh, really? I didn't know it was no menus. And actually, I knew this. Now I know the story, but I yeah. wanted you to share it with uh -huh. the audience. But um, I found the name intriguing and mysterious and yeah. so romantic. And, yeah. And, and, and <laughs> it sounds really smart. <laughs> like people, would, it sounds like, oh, that's a literary journal. I called up a friend, a <laughs> photographer, and I said, you have to get with this magazine. <laughs> and actually, we did arrange for her to be published in your magazine. Oh, wow. Eva Ritchie who shot the blue icebergs in oh, Patagonia. Yeah, that's right. I sent her to you. Amazing. Um, <laughs> one more question. Sure. You say that you prefer shooting in natural lighting. Yeah, Is that I, exclusive? Is that in studio as well? Yeah, I only mm -hmm. shoot natural light. Yeah. I am not, uh, I think, I, it might be far stretched, but I think most people light to have it look natural. Mm -hmm. And I always thought, why not just, you know, use natural light? So you bring in no equipment in terms of lighting? I mean, we, we can have equipment there mm -hmm. to make people comfortable. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> you know, people can get uncomfortable with the fact that you're shooting something with a lot of money behind it and right. you don't have lights. And you're waiting for the light to, be, to get... I mean, if you're light. shooting in London in, in February and it gets dark at 4 o'clock, you know, I'll still shoot natural light, mm -hmm. but then if we need to continue on till 7 o'clock, sure. you know, the last three hours will be lit. Okay. It's not my preference. Right. Should I pass this on to anybody else? All right, I guess I have, like, a multi-part question. So okay. it looks like looking at this image behind you, you use a lot of allusion to art history. So that's like, at least I think that's the joy of life. Yeah. Um, going into a project like that, how much, you know, because it's a large portfolio, do you leave a lot of leeway for yourself to improvise or do you yeah, have it's very all... specific? Okay, so you don't have very- No, specific. like I go into every situation having no idea what I'm doing for the most part. Okay. Knowing that, like, the research has come before, you know? Okay. Like, these, you can make um, obvious comparisons to paintings because I, you know, I've studied art history for half my life. So it's here, but, like, I don't go into, I'm not trying to make that picture necessarily, okay. you know? All right. Um, generally, it's like. Excuse me, you don't go in with, like, a mood board? No. Waiting, okay. I mean, it's, it's kind of like, um, what I describe it as that? like being like a spy. Like I kind of wish I was a spy. Okay. But it's like, you get a call, it's like we need you in London tomorrow or whatever. You show up in a, in a place, you have your camera. Mission you Impossible. Like, yes, you Mission Impossible, you figure it out. You know, it's like, here's your location, here's the clothes. Um, you can't, pre how can you prepare, you know, like, y you're, you're either prepared mentally or you're not. Okay, you and know? I guess that leads me to the other part was, it seems like you have a very specific idea about the fashion you want to photograph. Yeah. <laughs> what does it look like for you to work with a fashion editor? Like oh, it's a nightmare. Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, 
No, I mean, I, I'm just kidding. I have, <laughs> I have um, you know, there's like four or five stylists that I work with regularly who we have a relationship where they know what I like, but also like they're willing to let me take control sometimes. Um, yeah, the, fa- the, the, fashion, the fashion is either really important or it's secondary to the, to the landscape or to the series. Um, a lot of times for Bizarre, it has to be the forefront because, you know, editorial is still paid in advertising. You know. Thanks. Yeah. Hello. Um, I'm Ro. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask you, how do you deal with the um, assistants and uh, like personal team? Yeah, so my team is me and um, my everything, which is this guy named Matt. Matt (laughs) is my digital tech and my retoucher and my studio manager. And just generally, like, he hates me, but he's everything. (laughs) (laughs) Like, with it, he's, like, I'm this arm and Matt is this arm. That's why he's not here tonight. (laughs) <laughs> um, but yeah, I, you know, I, I, I don't do well with a lot of people. Like I'm, I pretty much like to do everything and I like to be involved in every aspect. So assistance, I've tried to have assistance and it's just not, I reach out to people when I need them, but for the most part, like they're just in the way because I would have to tell them. Like, I'm like, by the time I tell you what to do, I could have done it myself. That's, that sounds rude. I didn't mean it to be. <laughs> but. Yeah. Any other questions? Hey, Peter. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, just one thing I wanted to touch on, because I know you recently embarked on it, but moving image, film, yeah. digital, commercials how do you attack those differently than you attack your still pictures so that's a good question Uh um can i talk about gentle monster no yeah okay no no for the room not who's involved (laughs) great (laughs) these guys are my (laughs) these guys represent me (laughs) um we just did a big uh project with somebody that we can't talk about, um, a, but it, it involves a film, it, it, a film it's a or film. It's a, film. a short, this, yes, short film. This person is a known actor. Uh huh. Um, <laughs> bigger than a bread box. Bigger than a bread box. <laughs> and so, film to me is very different. I mean, <clears throat> like my, the way that I would like to think about film is more in film terms as opposed to fashion. Um, I guess fashion film. So, yeah, I, I, t- to answer your question, like when I eat my meal on my plate, I tend to segregate the foods, you know? And I try to, <laughs> <laughs> terrible at analogies, <laughs> but I try to think of like film very separately from photography. And, you know, that's what I was saying about black and white photography and color. Uh-huh. Like, it's easier for me to digest things or mediums when they're kind of pure, you know? Um, but you f- still think of color photography as impure? I mean, come on. <laughs> Second best. <laughs> let's, let's not go there. Let's not go there. Okay. Um, I mean, especially, like, right, your just, own I'm work. Kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> I know, I hope so. Um, <laughs> no, I, I, I mean, like, if I do more film, it's going to be more in a, a, in a very film referential context as opposed to uh, trying to make fashion films, I guess. Or animating pictures. Yeah. Right. Oh. Yeah. Like, I wouldn't want my film work to look at all like my fashion photography so work. Are there filmmakers that, would, that you'd love to be compared to? Yeah, I love Jonathan Glazer. I think he's amazing. Mm. Um, I don't know who. Jonathan Glazer. He's great. 
Look him up. Okay. <laughs> I'm writing it down. Um, yeah, I mean, I love, you know, Abbas Kiris, Kiristami, oh. um, Christoph Kozlowski. You getting these? No, but uh, go, right, go right ahead. <laughs> um, David Fincher, you know, oh. I still think is one of the greatest American film directors. Um, but again, you know, it's difficult because I am adverse to narrative a lot of times. Oh, yeah. Uh, and so you're just, that, that does you're make just it a like, difficult thing. Just destroyed your mind. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, there are it's always abstract film. Yeah. But, um, but you know, with a unnamed performer, that's a little <laughs> probably difficult. And a very commercial yeah. client. A I know. Difficult to carry off, I would guess. Oh, well, we, I think we did a good job. You'll see soon enough. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, another question oh, back here. Do, do you have a like a muse or model face? I know you don't like faces, but do you? I don't know. Yeah. So Gwen Guinevere. Uh, she was, or she is one of my favorite people to work with, but also because she, um, she's from an older generation, you know, she was big in the 90s. She's still, still relevant, obviously, but I think shooting the older girls, they're able to go into different character roles that, like, naturally and inherently that it's, really hard to find muses now who are young who are as comfortable as like just being themselves but also taking themselves into these thinking about it as as like an actor would as opposed to a model mm -hmm. i find now a lot of models they're present and they're and then they're like what do you want me to do as opposed to finding something inside and actually transforming for you without you having to direct them. And I'm not a good director, you know? Um, some people are really good at being this, this, this. I'm an observer. I always have been. So for me, when I, when I put a girl in front of me, I want them to really find it as opposed to me telling them what to do. Um, and is that difficult sometimes? Yeah, it's extremely difficult. I think most people don't, probably don't enjoy shooting with me until they see, because it's uncomfortable, you know, if, 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 if you were like, all right, just, just be. Be yourself. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's. But what's that? It's awkward, but I, I find that's the only way that I've known how to work. You know, I'm not. So um, are you. Do you try to work with some of the older models, some of the more experienced models? Yeah, yeah, I've worked with most of them. Um, Kirsty Hume, Audrey Marnay, um, oh. that whole lot, you know? The only one I think I haven't worked with, to be honest, is probably Kristen Mc McNenemy. Oh. But I mean, that would be great. It's yeah, no reason yeah there's something I... about the characters of that, that period that are still really interesting. Yeah, totally. Uh, even like Kirsten Owen, you know, who now, I think she's like 43, and she still, in my opinion, gets more beautiful every year, mm. you know. Um, but also like, they just come, they come from a different time where it was like, you had to be, you had to have this presence. Oh, you know? and well, and which I don't know. I that. would guess that also that was something that the photographers that they worked with valued and sort of, you know, made happen with them. Yeah. Uh, expected on some level. Um, are there other questions? Yes? <laughs> well, you told us about collaboration with Gucci. Yeah. I want to know more about uh, collaboration with Aganovich. Oh, uh, with Aganovich? Aganovich, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I know you're like really good friends and these are my favorite designers, so maybe some. Yeah, well, actually, we're just going 
we're shooting the new collection in a couple weeks. So Aganovich, there. Okay, so Aganovich is the young label at Michelle Montagne. So Michelle Montagne started Helmut Lang and then did all the Belgians, Antimio Meester, et cetera, et cetera. And I was in Paris and a good friend of mine, I was like, hey, <clears throat> I need a new designer to work with. Like, throw me a bone. Uh -huh. Who is making clothing that is amazing and like kind of flying under the radar? And they're like, yo, you should check out these guys at Ganovich, they're great. And we met and we immediately like hit it off and became best friends. And so now we just, we have this ongoing thing every season. Um, like they just, they actually just came out and stayed with us for a couple of days in the country. They're just like, they become like friend, uh, friends. Uh -huh. Yeah, I was looking for another word. <laughs> it's a good one. Um, yeah, and it, now it's just we, like I used to have that relationship with Mary Catranzi and we would do, every season we would do a lookbook and we'd just make pictures because we wanted to make pictures. And actually, Ganovich this season, in February, upcoming, they're not doing a, a show. They're only gonna do, we're only gonna make pictures and then release them to the world that way. So that's, oh. that's exciting. I mean, <laughs> it's so expensive to do shows too. If you're a young brand, you know, it's mm. like, I don't know how they afford it. Anyway. Um, now, um, because your rep is also here, I wanted to know how did you find a rep and like how did you know it was the right one? Um, a little bit of a question <laughs> uh, actually for both, I guess. How, how did I find them? Yeah. So, well, do you guys want to <laughs> Long um, story short. We, yeah. So, uh, Jimmy Moffitt is a. Uh, is he involved in the program? Yeah. Still, yes. Yeah. And co chair. Right. So, okay. Jimmy. SVA program. Right. He. I don't know if I'm telling this right. You can stop me if I'm not. He helped start this branch of IMG. Um, and I had been speaking to Jimmy for a little while about representation. And it's a. It's within IMG, so it's um, part. It's a division, you know, that just represents photographers and directors. Anyway, they were starting something new. It wasn't a traditional agency. It wasn't art and commerce. It wasn't art partner. And it's been eight months. It started just very organically. Um, I mean, historically, I've represented myself. Like I, you know. I don't know if you guys would say I'm difficult to work with, but I just, I like to do it, I like to do everything, you know? So for me, having an agent for a long time wasn't, wasn't easy. In the beginning, I had a, an agent, um, Stockland Martell, which is very commercial. Uh, they didn't really do fashion. And he kind of like um, nurtured me into the world of portraiture and introduced me to like Kathy Ryan at the New York Times and Jody Kwan at New York, uh, uh -huh. et cetera. So that's kind of how I started. But then I stopped with them and I was representing myself for a number of years, which I also really liked. It was just, um, it got to the point where, you know, so many jobs only come in to agencies. And if you're not if you're representing yourself, you're also just kind of putting yourself out of the equation at, at a certain point. No. Some photographers later in their careers, I think, have, like David Sims left the art partner, you know, three years ago or two years ago. I think there are certain cases of at that scale, you know, where you can do it yourself. You just get a studio manager instead of an agent. Oh. But um, those are few and far between, I think. Yeah, I would think it would be difficult and better to have someone out there stand up for you. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I stand up for myself. <laughs> Clearly. <laughs> we have just one, one more question. That's right. Uh, 
I know. That's a good segue for that. You said you'd stand up for yourself. <laughs> Is there clients or jobs you might not take? Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know why you're asking that, by the way. Um, yeah, so, well, we haven't really talked about ethics, and I know oh. we're at the end of this. You know, uh -huh. You're just going to roll your eyes. No, are there clients I wouldn't take? Yes, of course. And are there subjects I wouldn't shoot? Yeah. For example, I wouldn't shoot Donald Trump. Thank you. <laughs> um, and the reason he's asking is because, you know, a very reputable photographer shot the cover of time, uh -huh. and which has engaged a lot of us in conversation about is that appropriate? When is it just a job? Uh -huh. When do you, as an artist, have a you know an ethical responsibility to say no to an assignment? And is for me, I feel like that there are certain subjects where you do draw the line and you say no, I will not shoot them. What's another example? I mean, for a long time, I felt like the Wall Street Journal was a publication I wasn't willing to publish in because really? it's oh. owned by Murdoch and it's a, an extension of, you know, right-wing conservative media. Right. And to be honest, like, I don't think it's a, it's, it's a place where you can't ethically publish in the Wall Street Journal and then turn around on Facebook and complain about the Republican Party. You know, you're, oh. you, you become a propaganda extension uh -huh. by publishing, you know. There are certain distinctions like that, I think, uh -huh. at a certain point in your career where they're important. And if, you know, as an artist, you're part of the media spectacle, you have to take responsibility for your actions. Uh -huh. right. Oh, that's... Yeah, I still, yeah. That's thoughtful. Oh. Yes. Because so I, I tend to be uh, apolitical when it comes to things like fashion magazines. Yeah. Uh, especially because I think the Wall Street Journal magazine is quite a good one because they, they do got, get a lot of good photographers. Yeah. But I hadn't ever thought of the ethical question, and, and it's a strong one. You know? Yeah. I mean, it's the least. I don't know. I mean, some, but you can make the argument against it. You can say, you know, you're, you're, you're fulfilling a job and it's a higher job. I tend to think that you still need to maintain some sort of boundaries for yourself. Yeah, no, I totally agree. But that's just me. <coughs> so do you, did you want to make that the last question? Um, is there anything you guys want to close with? There was one person way over yeah. here. But, but when he's been raising his hand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Times. So let's just make this the last question. Now I can hear you though. Okay. You seem to have a very distinct visual style. Is that something that you found with time or was it something that was always inside of you? Um, that's a good question. <laughs> uh, I think that, yeah, I think I definitely found it during, through time. Um, you know, in the beginning, you, you, you're like anybody, well, there's a Louis C.K. bit where he's talking about a man on a first date, you know, and he's just like throwing like 20 different personalities at the girl <laughs> just to like see what will stick, you know? And that's like any young artist. In the beginning, you're like, I like this and I like this and I like this and I'm going to try this. But on the flip side of that, I think for sure there was like a certain style that I had developed as a kid painting with my mother that was probably in my head that took a little bit of time to come out through the photography, you know. But if I look back at my beginning work as a photographer, it was embarrassing. It was like you would look at a picture and be like, that would be a Sarah Moon. And then there would be a Paolo Reversi picture and then there'd be a this person that I copied. And, you know, that was fine because I was a student and I was trying to figure out what it was. And I think just through time, you know, just you realize what it is you like about certain people and you take little things and then over time you start making them your own, you know. But 
It's like Malcolm Gladwell, didn't you say, if you do anything for 10,000 hours or something like that, you'll make it your own? Uh, <laughs> I think he said that. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah. Anyway, thanks for coming. Thank you. Thanks for yeah.